left off, didn't we, seeing that the Amos was the, the, the trumpet, whose job was to, to, to sound the trumpet, to, to be the roar from Zion. And of course, all the way through Scripture, we're, we're, it's, it's unequivocal where it is that the Lord wanted Israel to worship. And it was at Zion, wasn't it? In the city of Jerusalem. And so it's of great offence to God that here in the northern kingdom of Israel, they've decided to set up uh, worship places, one of which being at Bethel, which we've already briefly seen. Let's just pick up a couple of uh, the, the points here, though, if we may. So we notice at the end of chapter 3, we have the first of the, uh, the mentions of the word Bethel, which is used seven times in this uh, short prophecy. In the day that I shall visit the transgressions of Israel upon him, I will also visit the altars of Bethel, and the horns of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground. Uh, we then, in, in chapter 4, and verse 4, Come to Bethel and transgress at Gilgal and multiply transgression. In chapter 5, verse 5, Seek not Bethel. At the end of verse 5, Bethel shall come to naught. And then if we went on and chased those references through in chapter 7, uh, we would see the same idea. So why is it that the people have set up the God, uh, th this worship in Bethel? Well, what is of interest to us is that we know why Bethel is famous, don't we? We'd go back, wouldn't we, to Genesis chapter 28, to, to Jacob uh, leaving his father's house in Beersheba and heading up north to, to, to Haran. And of course, he comes to the place where he sets up the pillar and uh, that place he calls Bethel, the house of God. And it's interesting that with that history in our mind, we see Jacob being mentioned frequently through the book of Amos. Six times, if I've put those references for you on the screen. Um, let me just take you to a couple, chapter 6 and verse 8. We read, The Lord God has sworn by himself, saith the Lord, the God of hosts, I abhor the excellency of Jacob and I hate his palaces. Um, let me give you another one. Uh, chapter 8, verse 7. The Lord has sworn by the excellency of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their works. So, I wonder if the point that's being made here through Amos by the Lord is that God is not in the least bit interested in the peace, these people turning up to Bethel in their pomp, in their splendour, to keep the feasts. You're kidding yourselves, Amos is perhaps saying to these people, if you like, if you think that your worship is based on the patriarchs, on Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, it's completely false. This is not the house of God. That's the worship I want of you. But don't think for one minute by going to Bethel, you're giving me this. We notice also another place that's mentioned. Did you, did you, did you notice in uh, chapter 4, when in verse 4, when it said, Come to Bethel and transgress, at Gilgal multiply transgression. And, and Gilgal is mentioned again in, in chap, chapter 5, verse 5. We saw Bethel mentioned twice, and Gilgal is mentioned twice. Nor enter into Gilgal, for Gilgal shall surely go into captivity. Well, well we know, don't we, what Gilgal was famous for. Just, just perhaps keep a marker again in Amos, but come back to Joshua. Joshua chapter 5. We, we've got the references for us on the screen to help us make some notes, but I think it's worth us turning there. Just come to Joshua chapter 5. I'd like to show you one word in this passage particularly. So we read in Joshua 5, verse 9, that the Lord said to Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you. So you remember that the, 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 the boys, the, the men in the camp, the men of war, were to be circumcised under the law. And they were to be circumcised to remind them that God was not interested in the flesh. 
He wasn't interested in the things of Egypt. And they were to have it removed far from them. And so the place was called Gilgal. Wherefore, the name of the place is called Gilgal to this day. And Gilgal, we know, means rolling, doesn't it? So as the flesh was rolled away, it was cut off, the people were forevermore to be reminded, I have brought you out of Egypt. I want you to have nothing to do with Egypt. Well, well, that Hebrew word... uh, isn't used very often. I just want you to come back to Amos and the chapter that we just read together. The idea of the word Gilgal, rolling away. In Amos and chapter 5, the chapter that we've just read, we read in verse 24... Let judgment run down. Now, if you have a revised version, it says, let judgment roll down. All right? So there's our word. It's not used very often in the scriptures, 18 times. So it's not a particularly well-used Hebrew word. And this is the last occurrence of that Hebrew word. Let judgment roll down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. And I think the point that is being made here by Amos, is I want you to get shot of the things of Egypt. It not it interesting that Egypt itself is mentioned seven times for us in the book of Amos? We won't chase those references. They're there for you. But what God is saying is, get rid of the things of Egypt, roll it away. And by contrast, what I want you to do is to roll into your lives righteousness as a mighty stream do you see we, we might say uh, that we want something to, to to trickle into our lives all right there's, there's perhaps the, the water analogy i don't know if it works for you it may not uh, but, but but that's what i felt would work for me all right what i'd like you to think though is how do we allow the word of God to roll into our lives to, to trickle into our lives do you know as a teacher uh, they, they, they ask us when they come in to inspect the schools they say you know and you say oh I, I've been doing this and they say well done what on earth is the impact and you say well I don't know about that but it was great fun uh, but they're right you know what's the impact why are you doing it what, what's it for What impact is that having on the lives of these children? How is that developing their well-being? How is that developing standards? How is that improving their outcomes? It's a good question. I think it's the right question. But, you know, we have to ask it of ourselves. Because the men and women in Israel in the days of Amos, they were living the most religious lives. They were turning up at Bethel. They were going to Gilgal. We shall see shortly. They were making trips down to Beersheba. But what they were doing was a pretense. It was a show. It was having no impact on their lives. The way they treated the poor and the destitute. And so we question ourselves, what's our ecclesia like? How practical are we in working in the truth? And so when we go on, let's just come back to chapter 4. We read... That Amos says, and of course it's ironical, isn't it, when he says, Come to Bethel and transgress. At Gilgal, multiply transgression. If that's what you want, crack on and do it. If that's what you're after in your life, go ahead. Bring your sacrifices every morning and your tithes after three years. And offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven. Proclaim and publish the free offerings. For this liketh you, O you children of Israel, saith the Lord God. If that's what you want in your life, you carry on. But it is of no consequence to your life, to your eternal life. In fact, it's to the detriment, isn't it? You are doing nothing to please the Lord God Almighty by just turning up at Bethel and at Gilgal, and pretending that your mind is remembering remembering the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
Do you notice that he says, offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven? And of course, under the law, should we just flick it up? Leviticus chapter 2. Under the law, we know, don't we, that they weren't allowed to have leaven in their sacrifices. Leviticus 2 verse 11, you should have noted in your margin next to Amos chapter 4 and verse 5. No meal offering which ye shall offer unto the Lord shall be made with leaven, for you shall burn no leaven nor any honey in any offering of the Lord made by fire. You are not allowed to bring leaven with your offering. And of course, Amos is ironically saying to the people, if you bring the leaven, if that's what you want, because the Lord God of the heaven and the earth is not interested in your offering. And do you remember what... The, 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 when the Lord Jesus Christ talks of the leaven and the leaven of the Pharisees should we just turn it up, Luke chapter 12 what is the leaven of the Pharisees what is it that the people are consumed with in the day of Amos Leviticus chapter, uh, Luke chapter 12 rather, verse 1 in the meantime When there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, Jesus began to say to his disciples, first of all, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. And these are the days of Amos. Hypocrisy is what has consumed these people as they go about their daily lives, their religious worship. And so when the Apostle Paul writes the Corinthians, he implores them, doesn't he? Purge out the leaven. Get shot of the hypocrisy in our lives. And so we've got to examine ourselves today. When we drive home tonight, in our minds, we've got to be thinking, is the leaven in my life? I've got to do my utmost to purge it out, to get shot of it. Am I going to make my faith A practical faith. What am I going to do tomorrow, on Monday? Have I got people coming to my home? Am I hospitable? But look, our faith has got to be practical, hasn't it? And it's so important that we don't just leave our fraternals. We don't just leave the meeting tomorrow morning and go away and think, well, that's given me a boost. Yes, that's reminded me again that the God of Israel is working in my life. How are we going to work in other people's lives to show that the God of Israel is with us? We've got to be different. We've got to make our faith a practical one. That was the problem in Amos's day. They turned up all right, but they didn't do anything about it in their daily lives. It's got to have an impact. Come back to Amos chapter 5. Now, I don't know um, if any of you have been interested in uh, chiastic structures. Uh, um, I'd like to show you one that's very, very simple in Amos chapter 5. And it has to be very simple because as a primary school teacher, I can't manage anything other than that, right? But in Amos chapter 5, I'd like to show you this. I I, I think this is of interest to us. Verse 4, do you notice we read, For thus saith the Lord unto the house of Israel, Seek ye me, and ye shall live. Now, if you go to verse 6, do you see we pick up the same phrase? Seek Yahweh, and ye shall live. Okay, so can you see that we've got a bookmark either end, haven't we? Now, what's interesting is that we then read, when we go back to the beginning of verse 5, Seek not Bethel. Then go to the end of verse 5. Because Bethel shall come to naught. Then we go halfway through verse 5. Nor enter into Gilgal. Just jump a a line in verse 5 still. For Gilgal shall surely go into captivity. Then right in the centre. And pass not to Beersheba. Now I don't know about you. But when I found myself in the middle of that chiasm, I found myself thinking, well, what on earth does that mean, right? Uh, uh, why, why is this here in the centre? Why, why are our minds being brought in here? And I think it's very clear that our minds are being brought in to this point. 
Well, think about Beersheba. Beersheba was the place where Abraham set up home, wasn't it? Let's just have a quick look. Keep a finger again in Amos and come to back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 22. Just to remind ourselves, and perhaps to make some notes in our margin, so Genesis 22, verse 19, we read that Abraham returned unto his young men. This is after uh, he's gone and had the faith to go and sacrifice Isaac, which of course he didn't need to because the ram was provided by the Lord God. And on the way back, they rose up and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. To just come to chapter 26 of Genesis. Because what we see here is that Abraham in his day had dug wells in Beersheba. In verse 15. For, for all the wells which his father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham his father, the Philistines had stopped them and filled them up with earth. Uh, and then we see that Isaac makes... Uh, Beersheba his uh, house uh, and, and his servants dig in the valley and they find these wells again and so we see in verse 25 that he built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there and there Isaac's servants digged a well and then in verse 33 we read and he called it uh, Sheba therefore the name of the city is Beersheba unto this day an oath the well of the oath. Now, I wonder if what is happening here in Israel at this time, j- j- just come back to Amos, because we see at the end of chapter 8, God says, They that swear by the sin of Samaria and say, Thy God, O Dan, liveth. And the manner of Beersheba liveth, or the way of Beersheba. And, and I wonder that the people of Israel at this time, this, this rich society, are saying, well, I tell you what I'm going to do. What, what are you doing in, in, in March? Oh, in March? Oh, we're taking a pilgrimage. Oh, we'd love to take a pilgrimage. We can't afford to take a pilgrimage. Oh, no, you can't. Of course you can't afford it, right? But we've got plenty of money. So we are. We're going down to Beersheba. Beersheba, that's miles. Yes, it's a hundred mile round trip from where we live. What are you going there for? Oh, the wells, the wells, the water there. Oh, it's magical, marvellous. And you wonder if they'd turn this place into something like Lord's is today, perhaps. Do you see that what they'd done is said, Abraham, Isaac, oh, that's my God. Abraham, and Isaac, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the patriarchs. Yeah, we'll go to Bethel. Or we'll go to Beersheba. Of course, that's Isaac's territory. That, that's, that, that's the territory of Abraham. Let's go there and wash ourselves in the water there. They turned the truth into an absolute farce. And of course, the point is this, isn't it? That, that what made those men different was that they looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. They were strangers and pilgrims. They weren't interested in going on some journey to be a Sheba. <coughs> and so Amos in chapter 4 says to the people again and again and again, that they're part of the final generation. We, we read in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 4, Hear this word, ye kind of Bashan that are in the mountain of Samaria, which oppress the poor, which crush the needy, which say to their masters, Bring and let us drink. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness that, lo, the days shall come upon you, that he will take you away with hooks, and your posterity with fish hooks. Well, we know, don't we? It happened. The history books tell us it happened. They were taken away with hooks and with fish hooks. Israel were taken away up north by the Assyrian. Just go to chapter 6. Because at the end of chapter 6, we read that God says, For behold, I will raise up against you a nation, O house of Israel, saith the Lord, the God of hosts, (coughs) And they shall afflict you from the entering in of Hemath 
unto the brook of the wilderness. You're in real trouble. And of course, this is the territory, isn't it, of Jehoshaphat the second in 2 Kings 14 that we looked at earlier. So you just might want to note in your margin at the end of chapter 6, 2 Kings 14, verse 25. That territory is going to be taken from you by a nation bigger and mightier than you, the northern hosts of the Assyrians. But coming back to chapter 4, what we see is that God now warns the people. And and what I think we see in chapter 4 is two things. One, the fulfilment of Deuteronomy chapter 28. Those of you who've got marginal references, you go from verse 6 all the way down to the end of chapter 4 in your margin and keep circling Deuteronomy 28, Deuteronomy 28, Deuteronomy 28, the blessings and the cursings. All right? I won't do it with you. Do it in your own time. But... What we've got here is the curses that have been brought upon Israel because they did not put their faith and their trust in God. And yet, through it all, God kept trying to turn them to him. Despite their constant failings, their constant faithless characters, the Lord God keeps trying to work in their lives to bring them back. And so we read in verse 6, And I also have given you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and want of bread in all your places. Yet have ye not returned to me, saith the Lord. Underline it, because we've got it again in verse 8. So two or three cities wandered unto one city to drink water, but they were not satisfied. Yet have ye not returned to me, saith the Lord. I've smitten you with blasting and mildew. When your gardens and your vineyards and your fig trees and your olive trees increased, the palmer worm devoured them. Yet have ye not returned to me, saith the Lord. Verse 10. I've sent among you the pestilence after the manner of Egypt. Your young men have I slain with the sword, have taken away your horses. I've made the stink of your camp to come up into your nostrils. Yet you've not returned to me, saith the Lord. I've overthrown some of you, as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you as a firebrand plucked out of the burning. Yet you've not returned to me, saith the Lord. And so can you see that what we've got here is what happens in our own lives. The angels are at work. They're bringing about situations that to the world seem like catastrophes. And yet God knows, we won't turn there, but you know, look at Job 33 later, that through suffering, he will work with us to turn us to him, to talk to us in our lives. And so we can rejoice when things happen in our lives that to the world seem like a disaster. And they may cut us to the quick. They may cause grief and upset. But have faith that the Lord wants us to turn to him. He wants us constantly to return to him. And so when we have affliction and trial and hardship, we know that the angels of God are at work in our lives. We can trust him. It's God who brings brings about evil to the city. Shall there be evil in the city? And the Lord hath not done it. God and the angels are working in our lives constantly. And we can trust and know of a surety that they are. But if we don't listen to the call, if we don't allow ourselves to return to the Lord God our maker, verse 12 of Amos chapter 4, Therefore thus will I do unto thee, O Israel, Because I will do this unto thee, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. Brethren and sisters, what a warning that is. We live in the days when it will not be long, when we have to stand before the judgment seat of the Lord Jesus Christ, who will come as Yahweh. He will come as the manifestation of, of the Lord God Almighty, and we will stand before him. And so the warning is given to us. Prepare to meet your God. And so we ask ourselves the questions, don't we? What are we like? Are we so different? 
Do you know, as Christadelphians, we are proud of the fact, and rightly so, that our faith is based on the patriarchs. You have try having a chat with someone who goes to the church down the road and they can't tell you about the promises to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. I was chatting to Brother Mike Jenner earlier. What are you speaking on tomorrow? I'm in Cambridge tomorrow. My lectures on the promises to Abraham. You don't see that anywhere else because it's the crux of our faith. The forgiveness of our sins is in the promises to Abraham. The promise of the land, the kingdom. And, and yet here... In the days of Amos, these men and women are using Abraham, Isaac and Jacob to set up some false worship, some pretense of a worship that meant nothing to God. And so there is a warning there for us, isn't there? That as we hold dear to our faith as we should, we need to make sure that we, our, our faith is a practical one. We're not consumed by the outward show. Come to chapter 8. <coughs> so in, in chapter 8 we read in verse 1, Thus saith the Lord God, thus hath the Lord God showed unto me, and behold, a basket of summer fruit. And he said, Amos, what, what seest thou? I said, A basket of summer fruit. <coughs> then said the Lord unto me, The end is come upon my people of Israel. I will not again pass by them any more. And the songs of the temple shall be howlings in that day, saith the Lord God. There shall be many dead bodies in every place. They shall cast them forth with silence. Hear this, O ye that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fail, saying, When will the new moon be gone, that we may sell corn? The Sabbath, that we may set forth wheat, making the ephah small and the shekel great, and falsifying the balances by deceit, that we may buy the poor for silver, the needy for a pair of shoes, yea, and sell the refuse of the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the excellency of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their works. What again a, a, a chilling message that is for us. It is for me. I will never forget any of their works. Shall not the land tremble for this and every one mourn that dwelleth therein? Now, interestingly, we're picking up rumblings here. Our first talk was entitled Two Years Before the Earthquake. Well, you must have felt like it was going to be 40 years before we got there. But, but we're starting to get there now. We notice, don't we, then, in verse 11, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, I will not send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. We live in the days of that famine. We live in an affluent society. In Coventry, for the most part, there's not a famine for bread or for water, but there is of hearing the words of the Lord. There is across the Western world, isn't there, a lack of willingness to open up the word of God. And so the warning is given at the end of chapter 8, not to get caught up in the ways of Beersheba. What are we doing with our time? Are we ensuring that the word of God is trickling into our lives? And so we noted, didn't we, in verse 8, that, the, that they must warn that the land would tremble for this and everyone mourn that dwells therein. And I wonder that that, that reference there in chapter 8 and verse 8 is the earthquake that is spoken of in chapter 1 and verse 1. And the time now is nearly upon them. And Josephus suggests that the Jews of that time believed that the earthquake happened when Isaiah went into the temple. Do you remember? Should we just quickly have a look in 2 Chronicles chapter 26? I, I know we were there earlier. But we stopped, didn't we? At the greatness of Isaiah. This king who had come to the throne aged 16, he reigned for 52 years. But for most of those years, I think, he was in trouble. And his son had to reign as, as regent, Jotham, in his stead. Because, verse 16, when he was strong, his heart was lifted up. Now if you think about it, if he started reigning when he was 16 years, 16 years old... 
14 years, him and Jeroboam reigned alongside each other. That takes him to 13. If Amos starts prophesying two years before the earthquake, and the earthquake is at this point, do you see we're not a great deal into Uzziah's reign, okay? So for a long time, he is a leper, which we know from verse 19. But, but Josephus, and of course we can't be certain, but suggests that the Jews of that time believed that when Uzziah believes that he's such an all-powerful king. He's forgotten that the only reason he's been so successful is because the Lord God has been with him, and he thinks he can take on him the role of the priest. He goes into the temple, and he offers incense, and he's in serious trouble. Then Isaiah, we read... Uh, was wroth he had a center in his hand to burn incense and while he was wroth with, wroth with the priests the leprosy even rose up in his forehead before the priests in the house of the lord from beside the incense altar and at that point josephus suggests the earthquake goes but there's a great lesson isn't there for us here his name spread far abroad for he was marvelously helped till he was strong and when he was strong his heart was lifted up. When the Apostle Paul writes to the Ecclesia in Corinth, he says to them, doesn't he? Let him who thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. Brethren and sisters, there's a lesson there for us, isn't there? Our strength is of the Lord and his alone. And if we ever find ourselves believing that what we do the success we may have, the small success in this life, is of our own doing. We're in serious trouble. Isaiah was a leper to the day of his death. Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. So we ask the question as we start to draw our thoughts to a close. I say start, I don't want you to be too excited. We've got a couple of slides left. How close are we to the time of the great earthquake? Because there was another earthquake some years later. Uh, we, we won't chase these passages, but you have a look. Amos chapter 9. We see a prophecy that Amos makes of an earthquake. And that earthquake is the one that we see in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1. In the year that King Isaiah died. All right? So Amos 9.1, you want to have in your margin Isaiah chapter 6. And Isaiah 6 is all about God no longer being prepared to walk with the people of Israel. Do you remember that Isaiah, that, that, that Isaiah sees a vision, doesn't he? And in his vision, he sees the, the, the glory of God. And the glory of God is the Lord Jesus Christ sitting on a throne. And we know it's the Lord Jesus because he quotes it of himself in John chapter 12. And he's sitting on a throne. And next to him are the seraphim. And the seraphim each have six wings. And with the first of their wings, they cover their face. In Isaiah chapter 8, we read that God says, I've hidden my face from the house of Israel. And with this, there are other wings, they, they cover their feet. In Isaiah chapter 8, we read that God says, I will no longer walk with this people. And with the other two wings, the seraphim did fly. Because the glory of the God of Israel is no longer going to be with those people. It's gone out to the Gentiles. Isaiah means the salvation of God. And the Apostle Paul, years later, in Acts chapter 28, quotes Isaiah 6, doesn't he? And he says, be it known therefore unto you, he says to the Jewish people that are there with him, that the salvation of God is come to the Gentiles. That's why we're sat here today. Because the salvation of God has come to us. Despite the disobedience of Israel, God has allowed us to be part of the covenant promises to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. But Amos chapter 9, let's just have a look there. There's a fulfilment that we've seen happen in just the last generation. Many of you were alive in 1948 when the state of Israel was declared. Those of you young people 
like me. <laughs> you look around, right? There are aunties and uncles in this room whose the hair was standing up on the back of their necks when the Lord God brought the people of Israel back to the land. We're in the generation that's nearly going. There are some sat here tonight that were there. They watched it happen. And do you know that we, those of us who are alive today, have seen these words come true? Uh, I, I'm going to try to play for you a, a short video. Uh, if, I, if it can't play, don't worry. Uh, we'll play it anyway, and if, if it picks up the sound, great. If it doesn't, I'll tell you what happens. This is uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. Biblical prophecies are being realized. As the prophet Amos said, they shall rebuild ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine. They shall till gardens and eat their fruit, and I will plant them upon their soil, never to be uprooted again. Veshavti etchvut ami Yisrael, uvanu arim neshamot v'yashavu. He's quoting the same words in Hebrew. Venatu kramim v'shatu et yeinam, v'asu ginot v'achlu et piryam, v'netatim al admatam v'lo inatshu od. Ladies and gentlemen, the people of Israel have come home never to be uprooted. So, in our days, in our days, that's in October 2013, two years ago, Netanyahu stands up in the United Nations building before all the world Come on, let's have a look at this. Isaiah, we're off script again. I need to show you this. Come here. Isaiah. To all the world. And he declares to them that the people of Israel are back in the land. Isaiah chapter 43. And we're in Isaiah 43 because Isaiah 43 is the chapter, isn't it, that we use on a Sunday evening as a prophecy to say that God always is working with the people of Israel because they are his witnesses and so what does God do in our days in the last couple of years he puts Benjamin Netanyahu the prime minister of Israel in the United Nations building and he gets him to declare to the world that they're back in the land he even gets him to quote the scriptures he quotes for us Amos chapter 9 as we just saw and so when Isaiah gives this prophecy, look what he says. Verse 8, or verse five, verse 5. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from far and my daughters from the ends of the earth. They're going to come back. They've come back in 1948. And then he says, verse 8, Bring forth the blind people that have eyes and the deaf that have ears. Let all the nations be gathered together. Let the people be assembled. Where are the people assembled? The United Nations General Assembly, right? Let all the people be gathered together. Let the people be assembled. Why? That they might know, verse 10, you are my witnesses, said the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am Yahweh. Beside me there is no saviour. We've seen it. It's happening in our days right now. The people are back in the land. Amos chapter 9 has been fulfilled they're there and so surely there's a great warning for us that the day of the Lord is coming come to Zechariah chapter 14 now Zechariah 14 we know is a prophecy that is yet to be fulfilled Behold, the day of the Lord comes. 
4 verse 2, I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. Then we read verse 3, that then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. His feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the... Half of the mountains shall remove toward the north and half it toward the south. So the earthquake has gone. The earthquake of Revelation chapter 16. And you shall flee by the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azale. Yea, you shall flee like as you fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. So the earthquake that we see in Amos chapter 8... The earthquake that Amos prophesies of, I'm prophesying two years before the earthquake, listen to me. That's the earthquake in the days of Isaiah, which shown is similar to what will happen when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. And I believe that we will be with the Lord Jesus as the saints, having marched up from Sinai, and as the kings of the east will come in by the way of the east. And Jerusalem will be on its knees because the Gogian host will have surrounded the city. And, and, and we're there. And, and we read verse, the end of verse 5. All the saints will be with thee. And it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark. Now, now the revised version margin says this. Just listen carefully. Another reading is there shall not be light the bright ones shall contract themselves. So do you see? This is the picture. We're there. We're on the ridge of East Jerusalem, on the mountains. We come to the Mount of Olives. Jerusalem's about to fall. In the morning, the armies of Gog will take her. And there are we, and we've marched up, and we contract ourselves. Whereas the saints, we're shining. But the light, the, the light of our shining is made dark. And it's almost to me like it was in the days of Gideon. Do you remember when the earthen vessel is placed over the torch? And when the shout goes, suddenly the earthen vessels which are us crumble. And the brightness shines out. And we're able to help the, the Jewish people who suddenly recognize him whom they have pierced and they mourn for him. And we get them out the city by the way of the valley, as in the days of Isaiah. We live in exciting times. Revelation 16. We know at the end of that chapter, or we, we hear of the great earthquake, don't we? In the days of Armageddon. And we're told that what will gather the nations is the spirit of frogs. Brethren and sisters, I think we live in extraordinary times. Last weekend, on Friday night, those attacks that happened in Paris, do you think that's just some form of, you know, is it just Paris? Of course it's not. Paris is, is, is the seat of democracy, right? That's what the world is telling us. That's why... On every social media page across the world, young people, old people have put the trickle law behind their profile. Incidentally, I think we should have nothing to do with it. But that's what you're seeing the world doing, right? Because the spirit of frogs has gone out. <coughs> you're seeing the beast, Europe. You're seeing Francois Hollande. You're seeing Angela Merkel talk about this and saying we're going to stand together. You're seeing the dragon, Putin, having his say on the matter. Don't worry, we'll stand with you. We're solid together. Everyone's flying the trickle on. You're seeing the false prophet say, this is the start of the Third World War. The spirit of frogs has gone out. Are we ready? Are we a people that are prepared? Come finally to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. How are we going to win this battle? How are we going to win the battle of Armageddon? Well, I'm sure 
It will be as it was in the days of Jehoshaphat. Think of Joel chapter 3. There we are, the valley of Armageddon, the valley of judgment. In 2 Chronicles chapter 17, we read, 2 Chronicles 20, apologies, 2 Chronicles chapter 20 in verse 17. You shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord, Yahweh, will be with you. And so they finished their prayer. And they rose, verse 20, early in the morning, and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. Here we are. We're back, aren't we? We're back with the prophet Amos. We're going to go to the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me. Hear this word. Hear me, O Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. And so as they go forth across the wilderness of Tekoa, we read verse 24 that when Judah came toward the watchtower of the wilderness, they looked into the multitude. Behold, there were dead bodies fallen to the earth and none escaped. And they returned then, verse 27, they returned every man of Judah and Jerusalem and Jehoshaphat in the forefront of them to go again to Jerusalem with joy. For the Lord had made them to rejoice over their enemies And they came to Jerusalem with psalteries and harps and trumpets to the house of the Lord. Do you want to be there? Is that what you want more than anything else in your life? That when the Lord Jesus Christ comes, have we prepared ourselves to stand before him? Are we ready? Of course we know we fail each day. By the grace of God go we. That's the point in our faith, isn't it? That the Lord Jesus Christ has made up for our failings. God has put in a master plan to enable us to inherit the promises made to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Are we ready? Is that what we want more than anything else? To be there together as the saints in that day. To go forward after the the destruction of Armageddon, laughing, singing with our children, with our grandchildren, with our grandparents, with our great-grandparents, and those who've died in faith. Do we want to be there when we come to Jerusalem with psalteries, harps and trumpets to the house of the Lord? Brethren and sisters, we live in the last days. Hear this word and prepare to meet your God.